welcome to Brookdale's Visiting Writers Series show. I'm Michael Brook, a professor of English here at Brookdale, and I'm really excited to be here today with Eduardo Corral, an award-winning poet and uh, author of Slow Lightning, as well as many other works that we're going to talk about today. And I'd like to start, I think, Eduardo, we were talking a little bit before about how you began to write yeah. and as an undergraduate, what that process was like for you. And uh, where were you? What were the circumstances in which you began to write, to write poems? Well, thank you, Michael, for having me here. Uh, you know, I didn't start writing poetry or reading poetry until I was uh, like my second year as an undergrad at Arizona State University. You know, mm -hmm. I floundered a bit as an undergrad. It was a psychology major, then another major, then another major, right? And then my second year as a sophomore, I signed up for a Chicano literature course, a Mexican-American literature course. Mm -hmm. And um, I took it. I went to the first day of class. My professor handed the syllabus out. I noted in the syllabus, oh, in the middle semester, we're going to write poems in this class. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not a poet. I don't read poetry. What is a poem? What, I, have a, I was confounded. I didn't want to even bother with it, right? Mm -hmm. So I was going to drop the class after that first session. But then I noticed, but, but then I remembered, you know, that class met twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. I could do that twice a week week, right? Mm -hmm. But if that class had met earlier, like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., I would have totally dropped that class. Forget it. Yeah, I would <laughs> right. totally drop it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a morning person. Right? <laughs> and, and in that class, after I wrote those first poems with my hands shaking like this, the mm -hmm. professor pulled me aside afterwards and said, um, why don't you write more poems? Just show them to me. And like, okay. I wanted, you know, as I was an eager undergrad, so I wanted to impress my teacher. So I wrote more poems for him. And then he said, okay, now that you're writing poetry, I didn't know I was writing poetry. He said, uh -huh. how about you start reading poetry? So he gave me a list of eight to 10 poets, Derek Walcott, Gary Soto, Philip Levine, Rita Dove. I went to the library, checked out these books, and instantly fell in love with poetry, right? Mm -hmm. There's where it happened for me, the switch, right? Mm -hmm. From the young undergrad trying to please his professor to like, oh, wow. How can I throw my hat into the ring now? What can I do as a reader? first, right. how can I take it in, take it in, take it in, and what can I do on the page now, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Even then, I had those like, what can I do now, right? Because I was so enthralled by what they were doing, right? Like Derek Walcott. Yeah, I was amazed. Right. I mean, yeah. I remember reading like, his similes and metaphors and lines and walking away from the, uh, the book, putting it back on a table and just walking away just shaking with pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. Shaking with pleasure. And so that was as an undergraduate. Yes. And then eventually you went on to win the Yale Younger Prize, yes. the oldest literary prize in the country. Yes. Um, some wonderful luminaries have won it. Yeah. And that was in 2011. Yes. So how long did it take you to get from the undergraduate, you know, beginning to write poetry mm -hmm. to having this book accepted by Yale? Well, uh, after graduate, after... I graduated at Arizona State University in 1999, right? So right mm -hmm. after graduate school, uh, um, undergrad, I went straight to graduate school, right? I went to the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. So from undergrad to graduate school. So it took me, uh, my program was a two-year program. So I finished in 01. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we got all these jumbo of, all these jumbo of numbers mm -hmm. here, yeah, yeah. Right. But it was a two-year program, right? You know, I say this again and again in interviews. It was a really bad program for me to attend, right? Yeah, yeah, you know. I, as an undergrad, I felt nourished and encouraged as a reader and as a writer and you know, as a creative person. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't receive that kind of uh, a mentorship and attention at, at, in graduate school, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I like to say all my gifts were diminished in graduate school and all my anxieties were nourished and brought up, right? So I left that hmm. program in 2001 uh, broken, right? intellectually okay. and uh, emotionally. So I, I, I said to myself, I'm not gonna write another poem, this is it, this is it. So I just left my, I left Iowa on a Greyhound bus and went back to Arizona and lived with my parents and started looking for a job, right? And mm -hmm. I, that's where I first got my gig uh, as a Head Start teacher, right? For two years I was a Head Start teacher, right? Uh -huh. But when I started teaching uh, young children, I noticed how attentive and how playful they were with language, right? You know, children mm -hmm. love language, and they just say whatever comes to mind, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that started me working with language again, right? It started me, like, I started notebooking again, writing drafts. About, it was about six to eight months after graduate school that I picked up the pen again, right? Mm -hmm. But it took me a while to, like, uh, let go of the poison you know, that was uh, kind of... Your graduate school experience. Uh, yes, yeah. Right, and it's right. still, and I'm actually very, still kind of very bitter about it, right? Yeah, I still, okay, those are those... Uh, graduate school should not be a time for you to, like, to be, like battered, right? Like that, like that. So, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'm very, on one hand, I'm very grateful that I went to Iowa because I met a handful of very talented young writers who are still my friends, right. and I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, but if I had to do it again, I would not go to that program. Hmm. And actually, I have a hard time recommending other people to go there. But you survived and yes. thrived eventually. And then, yeah. so if that's 2001, then eight or nine years later, you're working on this, this manuscript or, or over that period of time that became yeah, it took slow me, light. Yeah, it took me about nine and a half years to uh, work on this manuscript before I sent it out, before it got picked up, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In those nine and a half years, I worked as a library assistant, a Head Start teacher. I was lucky enough to get some post MFA fellowships and residencies, so that mm -hmm. kind of helped too. But the last two years, as I worked on the manuscript, I was working at the Home Depot. Really? In Castro Grande, Arizona, yeah, uh, hmm. as a cashier, right? Because mm -hmm. I, there I could leave, when I left Home Depot, I left work there, right? I didn't have to take it home with me, right? Mm -hmm. So I would go home and help raise, my parents are raising three of their grandchildren, so I would help with that. Right. And after they finally went to sleep, to bed, and after they finally knocked out, I would go into my room and work on the manuscript, right? Wow. Yeah, at from two in the morning to like three or four. Yeah. I think it's really good for, it's good for me to hear, and I think good for our audience and our students to hear as well, because we have creative writing classes here at Brookdale. Um, and we are impatient. Just I'm yeah. impatient as a writer, and, st and students are impatient. We want to write things and have them. I know. was impatient in those nine and a half years. Mm -hmm. for the, I would say for the first four years, I was really impatient with my process. I'm a very slow writer, and it took me a long time to realize that I write very slowly. Mm -hmm. I'm very brutal with myself when it comes on the page, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe not. Uh, it seems to have worked out yeah, well. Yeah, but <laughs> for like, but f I actually stopped like subscribing to Post and Writers Magazine. Uh, after graduate school, because I was full of envy and jealousy, right? As a mm. young writer, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why are they writing and getting published? Why are they winning X, Y, and Z, right? Instead of, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Because, and then I was start, well, you don't have a book in the world. Why are you even right. worried about this? But that kind of professional jealousy was really, really damaging me and my process to the writing. So mm. I learned how to deal with that quickly, right? Well, I'd like to introduce to the audience your voice. Yeah. So can we take a look at one of the poems oh, sure. from the book? Um, I'd like to start, if we could, um, with a poem called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, which occurs very early mm -hmm. in the book. Okay. And then a poem by the same title occurs late. So maybe if you could read the, the first poem, mm -hmm. which is the second poem in the book or so, I think. Mm -hmm. We need the first one, right? So, yes, we're okay. going to read, okay. read the... Uh, you want me to talk a little bit about it or just read it? Read it first? Um, read it first okay. and then we'll talk about it. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. I approach a harp abandoned in a harvested field. A deer leaps out of the brush and follows me in the rain. A scarlet snake wound in its dark antlers. My fingers curled around a shard of glass. It's like holding the hand of a child. I'll cut the harp strings for my mandolin, use the frame as a window in a chapel yet to be built. I'll scrape off its blue lacquer, melt the flakes down with a candle and ladle, and paint the inner curve of my supo. The deer passes me. I lower my head, stick out my tongue to taste the honey smeared on its hind leg. In the field's center, I crouch near a boulder engraved with a number and stare at a gazelle's blue ghost, the rain falling through it. Thank you. Can you talk about it? One of the first questions that comes to mind, it's a beautiful poem. It's a beautiful lyric poem. It's wonderful images. Thank you. Thank you. The title, when someone sees that, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, I think they're going to approach the poem with certain expectations, yes, yes. which are confounded by what you just read. Yes. So can, can you read about the, the, your process of the poem or, or how the poem fits with the title and, and so forth? Yes. You know, I came of age in, in this very small town in southern Arizona, Casa, Gran, Casa Grande, which means big house in Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, they, late 80s, early 90s, you know, as a young gay boy, young gay brown boy, and uh, at the height of the AIDS epidemic, right? Mm -hmm. And in my small town, the library didn't have any books about gays or lesbians, no book about the AIDS epidemic, right? I know, because I asked, and I asked, <laughs> and I looked, and I looked. Mm -hmm. So the only imagery I had of gay men were these images on the nightly, on the nightly news, right? At the five o'clock, you know, mm -hmm. with Tom Brokaw, right? Uh, these men who are always very skeletal, right? And, you know, kissed both by disease, death, and public scorn, right? They were like, mm -hmm. you know, they were, they, were, they were not held up, right? You know, mm -hmm. and as a young gay boy, it was a huge like, emotional, select, emotional intellectual wound. You know, you know, this was the only option I kind of thought I had in the world. The only possibility was death for me, right? Because mm -hmm. the only imagery I saw, right? Mm -hmm. So for like two years, honestly, I went to sleep imagining what if scenarios, right? 
Mm -hmm. As a young boy, you know, not even second, no, no kiss, no nothing. I already imagining death as my future, right? I so I would go to sleep imagining these scenarios. And that's why I kind of think my, my imagination really, really, really took root and kind of grew, right? Mm -hmm. In these kind of uh, grotesque what if scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. What if, what if, what if, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for those two years, yeah, that's how kind of my, imagination, my, my imagination grew and grew. And that's why I think in my work now, I'm attracted to the, like, the grotesque, the sublime, the braiding mm -hmm. of the beautiful with darkness, right? You know, there's all this kind of balancing of life and death again and again in the work, right? Right. Um, so, but that said, it, it took me nine and a half years to work on the manuscript. And I, for the longest time, tried to write a poem talking about that hurt, that experience, that wound of, as a young gay boy, seeing only death as a possibility, right? And a poem with a speaker who was me, the I was me, right? Mm -hmm. But I could never make it work. I could never make it work in a way that felt real, right, to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put those drafts away. And the only way I could talk about the, that epidemic, my kind of fear about the virus, was through kind of what Carl Phillips called the magically real, the sort of kind of surreal kind of lyrical space. Mm -hmm. That allowed me to talk about the disease, the fear, in a way that made me okay with it, right? That way I, it, wasn't, it wasn't about my fear experience, right? It was something more, right? Mm -hmm. In the poem I read, you know, there's a, number, there's a boulder engraved with a number, right? Right. right. Yeah. Uh, there's a deer with his, uh, smeared with honey, right? Yeah. These are very beautiful, but also uh, death-drenched imagery, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Or, right. Yeah, so. It's, it's really lovely. And then um, we're going to take a break for a second. And when we come back, what I'd like to do is also then read the companion piece at the end of the book. Wonderful. And maybe talk about the relationship then Perfect. between the two. Yeah, yeah. All right. So thank you very much for being with us. We're going to take a short break. Uh, this is Brookdale's Visiting Writer Series show. I'm Michael Brook with Eduardo Corral, and we'll be right back. When I was divorced, I needed to rediscover who I was. I had no career or college degree. My divorce attorney was so supportive. Working with her helped me realize I have what it takes for a career in law. I joined the paralegal program at Brookdale and I got a great base to build a career on. Now I'm working as a paralegal at Ansel Grimm and Aaron and I love it. I'm Michelle McCarran and I went to Brookdale for a new start. I never imagined I would find my calling. With both my sons entering college, I knew financial aid was going to help. I never thought I would qualify, too. I enrolled in Brookdale's culinary program and discovered a world of talent I never knew I had. After graduation, I landed an externship with David Burke's Fromagerie, and they hired me a month later. My name is Debbie Doran, and I came to Brookdale to learn a new skill. I never imagined it would take me this far. Hello, and welcome back to Brookdale's Visiting Writers Series show. I'm Michael Brook, here today with Eduardo Corral. And Eduardo, we were just talking about one of the poems early in the book yeah. called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. But the same title occurs at the end of the book as well. Yes. Could we begin again by reading that second sure. poem and then? Be my pleasure, Michael. Okay. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. At a quarter to midnight, Blue beetles crawling along the minute hand of the wall clock. I awaken, panicked, next to my lover. A carmode hued cello asleep on embroidered linen. A light bulb blazes, burns out. A doe's flash a white tail that instructs the fawn to follow its mother in flight. I hurry down a hallway, through a door, into a pasture where mules are grazing. Moonlight floats in the air like coarse cloth, silver speckled and woven on the looms of mirrors. Once I tore into the torso of my cello and discovered its heart, a pair of horseshoes caked with red clay. The mules surround me, necks bent, nostrils pluming out different lengths of breath. I toss off my robe. A mule curls his tongue around my erection. I throw my head back and stare at the slowest lightning, the stars. Thank you. 
So the poem, similar imagery, yes. same exact titles yeah. appearing. Can can you speak to that? One beginning at the beginning of the book and nearly closing the book. How 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 did you put this together? Well, I'm a big fan in in in, in books, even poems themselves, of symmetry. Right, things mm -hmm. that kind of balance out. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was one way to kind of balance out. I thought the collection because uh, they're both kind of like lyrical, surreal, magical spaces, right, these two poems, right? Mm -hmm. So the rest of the poem, the rest of the collection is bookended by these magical spaces, and the middle is like these narratives about the border crossing, other lyric spaces, ephrastic work, right? Right. But I wanted it to be the book kind of framed by these magical, lyrical space, right? Because mm -hmm. there's where I, I think I'm at my best as a poet, right? Mm -hmm. And I, that's where I feel more comfortable, and those are the kind of spaces I seek out as a reader, right? Interesting. Let's talk about some of the elements of the, the book. You just mentioned a few. How about the language itself? Yes. Uh, one of my very early interests uh, as an undergraduate was reading Gloria Anzaldúa's book, um, Borderlands, La, La Frontera, Frontera yeah. Front, right, which was a hybrid of different styles and languages, languages. Spanish and English. And in Slow Lightning, there, Spanish occurs quite often. Yes. So can you speak about having a bilingual book? Yeah. Um, why, what, what kind of borders are you crossing when, when you're doing that? Or... Yeah, well, it's called, you know, it's called code switching, when you shuttle back from one language to another in a text. Mm -hmm. um, I was a terrible graduate student because <laughs> I was writing poems in Iowa to impress my teachers and peers on one hand, mm -hmm. and none of them spoke Spanish, so it even dawned on me to write these code switching poems, right? These poems I shuttle back from English and Spanish. So you only um, wrote poems in English, English as only. a graduate never, student? It never dawned on me. In the, about four or five years after graduate school, I was walking, I was walking, and, and just had, I just thought, I had a thought, why can't I write a poem that kind of echoes and parallels the way I think, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes in my head, a sentence begins in English and in Spanish, or vice versa, even, even at the phrasal level, right? Mm -hmm. This is the way I think, I'm bilingual, right? So this is the way I think, so why can't, why can't I write a poem that way? Mm -hmm. It was a very simple breakthrough, and it, which en enabled me to write the code switching poems, right? But for me, the, code, the Spanish has to be part of the authentic, organic process, right? I, I, don't, I rail against use of Spanish or any kind of other, other language in, in, in an English heavy text that feels like ethnic embellishment, right? Mm -hmm. As a gesture to cute otherness, right? Uh, Café con leche italicized, the moon like a piñata italicized, you know, those are too cute. You know. mm -hmm. We needed those poems in the 60s, 70s, the first wave of Latino writing in this country, I think, mm -hmm. but we don't, we're not there anymore, right? We're not there anymore. We have Junot Diaz writing uh, uh, paragraphs and in, in, in slang, Spanish slang now, right? We don't need that, right? Mm -hmm. we, we're in a different space, and I, I know that as an artist too, right? Mm -hmm. So I, write, I wrote these cool searching poems with that in mind, right? The Spanish had to come in the drafting process, right? Okay. English, 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 and then a Spanish phrase pops up. Oh, okay, that's organic, right? Mm -hmm. So if, it, if, it, if, if that Spanish word or phrase made it through the revision process, and it's a long revision process, then it became part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And often in the co switching poems, if the Spanish is pulled out, the kind of poem collapses, right? There's no poem left. So it's an integral or organic part of the poem. It has to be poem. part of the, vital, the imagistic and sonic structure of the poem, right? It's not ethnic embellishment. Mm -hmm. That's why I really rail against, right? It's not there as a cutesy gesture toward my otherness, right? Mm -hmm. Or as, as my otherness as is perceived or read by others, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's not a marketing tool, right? It's an authentic use and a vital use of language on my part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a vital part of the poem that can't be teased out. No. And that's it. I can't. I cannot write a poem completely in Spanish because my Spanish hmm. is not that good, right? A, mm -hmm. a very conversational. Yeah. I was even though Spanish was my native tongue, it was kind of educated out of me because English only education, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's why uh, it's code switching is the best possibility for me, right? Can you speak about otherness then a little bit, or 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 border crossing? Um, it seems like there's a lot of concern. There's literal borders that are yes. crossed in the poems. Yeah. The border between Mexico and the United States. But there's borders being crossed also in terms of language, like you're, like you're talking. How do you orient yourself, or do you even worry about orienting yourself within or outside a border as, as a poet, as, as a man, yeah. as, as an American, yeah. as, as uh, a bilingual? Yeah. You know, how do you orient yourself? I'll talk, I'll tackle the poet part first. You know, okay. For the longest time after graduate school, I really f f had a, I struggled. Am I Latino enough on the page? Am I not Latino enough? Like, and what does that mean? What, is mm -hmm. it, what does Latino mean on the page? What does it mean to write a Latino poem, right? a Chicano poem, right? What does it mean to be a Latino poet in this country, a Chicano poet? Mm -hmm. And I struggled. I had no idea what the answer was, right? Uh, but I found a, a solution in Robert Hayden, 
right? Robert Hayden is one of my primary influences. He was a great African-American poet mm -hmm. um, who died in 1980. Um, his poems taught me that it's possible to write beautifully about the given particulars of your life, right? What you've mm -hmm. been given, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also to possibly to write beautifully about anything else that interests you as an artist, right? It seems as a simple idea, right? right? But the way he enacted it, the way he carried it out on the page again and again, he writes these beautiful poems about black history, mm -hmm. right? Those are those famous anthology pieces, right? Middle Passage, et cetera, Frederick, Frederick right. Douglass. But he also writes as well uh, other beautiful poems about loneliness, friendship, mm -hmm. emphastic work, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, lone poems about doubt and faith. And, and Hayden and, himself had this question in his in the black community of poets about what his identity was, or whether he was black enough, or whether he was exactly, writing through. Exactly, right, yeah, yeah, he said, I'm a poet. Mm -hmm. yeah, so he said, I'm a poet, right, mm -hmm. yes. So Hayden, you certainly reference in the in the book, In Slow Lightning, what again are some and again, of, yeah, again, again, I, I again. steal from him again and again. Right, you yeah. actually are, are, are borrowing yeah, yeah. from some of his poems. What, what are some other uh, poetic influences that, that appear in the in the book? Uh, for me, uh, like Jose Montoya, who is a, the, the middle po the middle section of the book, is a variation on a theme by Jose Montoya. It was right. a very, he's very famous in Chicano poetry, right? Mm -hmm. He's a very famous code switcher, right? He's a Korean War vet, and he has a famous poem called El Louis. Mm -hmm. That's the, my poem kind of riffs on, right? This, right. And that you know also is a good role model how to incorporate uh, Spanish slang and vernacular into English, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big role model for me. Uh, people who are named in the book like Bay Dow and Jean Valentine, I'm v I'm very 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 indebted mm -hmm. to, right? Mm -hmm. And also somebody who's not mentioned often in the reviews, but I see her influence so heavily in Slow Lightning is uh, C.D. Wright. Really? C.D. Wright has been a big influence. It continues to be a big influence, mm -hmm. too, because she incorporates vernacular, right, from the South, from Arkansas, right, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. into her work, right? And mm -hmm. that also is what was very freeing for me. Oh, mm -hmm. I see the kind of different Englishes she's playing with, right? Interesting. Not just one English for this, plural, right? She's working with Multiple various, Englishes, right? various registers of English, very, right. very tones of English, and I love that, and I love that. One of the other, I don't know if it's an influence, but touchstones in the book seems to be art as well. Yes. You're writing several ekphrastic poems in response to various artists. Can you speak to what artists you chose to write about? Because most of them seem to be uh, Latino artists um, and more contemporary. You're yes. not writing about you know yes. art you know 500 years ago. You're writing about work ha you know happening today. Yeah. Let me just uh, begin by saying, if we could go, if there was a space in the world where we could go in and exchange for a gift we had for other gifts, I would go and say thank you for whatever gifts I have with language, but. Let me be a visual artist instead. Really? In a heartbeat, yeah. It's always been a dream of mine to be a visual artist, right? Mm -hmm. So even as a young boy, I would collect postcards or tear out pages of uh, art catalog books from the library. Sorry, <laughs> but I would do that. <laughs> that was yeah. you. Yeah, that was me, that was me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I would carry them around, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so when I go to museums, I often have a very emotional reaction to a lot of pieces, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's how I know I have to write about a piece, right? I write a lot more fantastic poems that are published, right? I just write them again and again. Mm -hmm. But if I have a very visceral, like, a really emotional reaction to it in person, in a museum, or even via page or postcard, I know I have to respond to it, right, on the page, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, here's the challenge with a frastic work. Most art pieces are languageless, right? It's only the piece, right? right? The pain, be it abstract or pictorial or, you know, there's the piece, right, the sculpture, the painting. It's, it, it's languageless, right, except for the title and the name of the artist, right? Mm -hmm. I am, a, as a poet, I'm intrigued. How can I overlay language over that languageless space, right? Mm -hmm. How can I do that with my aphrastic work? And that often means veering away from what the, another artist has done, right? My aphrastic work doesn't duplicate, right? Doesn't tell you what the piece looks like for the most part, right? Right, as I was reading the in the, the poems in the book, I had to go look up the artwork yeah. to see actually what it visually was uh, yes. because it's not really clear from the poem. Yeah, yeah. I see my fantastic work as a conversation with the artist, right? Like mm -hmm. this. Uh, all art's a conversation, you know, right. we're having a conversation with other artists, other writers, other poets, right? And this is a way for me to engage another piece of art, right? Engage with other artists, see what I can add to what they've done, right? And mm -hmm. I see it as an adding to, right? Mm -hmm. I like this. Interesting. Yeah. We're gonna have to wrap up here in a minute, but in the last 30 seconds or so, <laughs> can you speak to what are you doing now? Do you have a project that you're working on? Well, the book came out about three, year, three, three years ago, and I'm just right now drafting, drafting, and revising, and revising, just mm -hmm. working on new poems. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. There's no project in mind yet. I'm just drafting no. and getting material out on the page. Mm -hmm. See what happens. And you're living in New York City, in so Queens is, for is that three, yeah. entering uh, into, into not the yet. No. Not yet, yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, you know, not yet. Not we'll yet. see, we'll see. But the one of the things that we talked about earlier was language, and you do see such a variety of, of language and language, language experiences in, yeah. in the city. Be, living in the city hasn't it manifested itself in the page, in mm -hmm. the pages, but the, in the notebooks, it's there, right? Mm -hmm. Overheard conversation, eavesdrop, you know, eavesdropping, typos in menus and handwritten signs in hmm. Queens, New York. They're, they're, that kind of stuff is everywhere in the notebooks, right? right. So eventually, you'll make it into the work. But We're not the now, yeah. Right, where yeah. the language is, you are. Yes. 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 All right. Well, thank you very much, Eduardo. Thank you, it's, Michael. It's been wonderful. My pleasure. I look forward to the reading tonight. And um, thank you for joining us. This is Brookdale's Visiting Writer Series show. I'm Michael Brook. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in uh, writing here at Brookdale Community College, please visit our website at brookdalecc.edu and check out our course listings. Thank you. Good night.